Hey guys, welcome to Learn Today IGCSE. This is a tutorial video for Physics, Paper 6, Variant 6-2 for February-March 2023 examinations. Question 1. A student determines the diameter of a marble by two methods and calculates the density of the material from which the marble is made. Some marbles are shown full size in Figure 1.1. These marbles are usually placed in between two blocks and the length between these two blocks are measured. Method 1. On figure 1.1, measure the length D. To get the length D, just place your ruler accordingly and you will get a value of 7.8 cm. Next, using your value of D, calculate the average diameter of one marble. To calculate the average, we will take the total length divided by 5 marbles, giving you 1.56 cm. However, over here we have written the answers in two significant figures. Therefore, we are going to use the same method to write our answers and it will be 1.6 cm. Part 2. Suggest why it is more accurate when using a ruler to measure D for 5 marbles rather than measure the diameter of a single marble. Each marbles are not designed 100% identical. Therefore, they might have a slight difference in their diameter. So, in order to be more accurate, we take the average of a few marbles. So, for your answer, you can say that the diameters of marbles can vary from one another. Method 2. Figure 1.2 shows two wooden blocks and one of the marbles. Describe how the student uses the two blocks and the marble to determine a new accurate value for the diameter of a marble. Draw a diagram to show the arrangement. Describe clearly how the student ensures that the value for the diameter of a marble is as accurate as possible. So we are going to place the marble in between the two blocks and measure the gap to obtain the diameter. This will give you one mark. We also have to state another point to ensure that the value for the diameter is as accurate as possible. To do that, we will rotate the marble to different axes and take the average of measurements. This will give you your second mark. Remember that in paper 6, whenever you are asked about accuracy, always mention to repeat the readings and take the average. Question C, part 1. The student uses the top pen balance as shown in figure 1.3 to measure the mass of the 5 marbles. He measures the mass M0 of a beaker without the marbles and then measures the mass M5 of the same beaker containing the marbles. Record the values of M0 and M5 as shown on the top pen balance in figure 1.3. So just write your value of M0 and M5. Next, use these values to calculate the average mass M of one marble. M0 was 30.8 and M5 was 64.3, meaning that the difference in their masses would represent the mass of 5 marbles. So to find the average of one marble, we can just divide it by 5 giving us 6.7 grams. Part 3. The student pours water into a measuring cylinder. He records the reading V1 of the water level in the measuring cylinder, 26 cm cubes. The student places the 5 marbles into the water in the measuring cylinder as shown in figure 1.4. Record the new reading V2 of the water level in the measuring cylinder as shown in figure 1.4. When taking reading of measuring cylinders, place your eyes at eye level to avoid parallax error and read the scale below the meniscus level. And this level here is at 38. Part 3. Calculate a value for the average volume V of one marble. Use the values from C part 2 and the equation. So let's just substitute our values in. The value of V2 is 38 and the value of V1 is 26. This will give us a value of 2.4. Remember your answers should remain in two significant figures as these are also in two significant figures. Part 4. Calculate a value for the density of the material from which the marble is made. Use your values of M from C part 1, V from C part 3 and the equation. Alright, let's just substitute our values in. The mass from C part 1 was 6.7 grams and the V from C part 3 was 2.4 cm cubes giving us this value so make sure you write this in two significant figures that being 2.8 next question d describe one possible source of inaccuracy in the method described in part c and suggest one improvement to reduce its effect 
In method C, by calculating the density, we are using a measuring cylinder to obtain the volume. An inaccuracy that could happen when using a measuring cylinder is that if it's too wide, the readings could be slightly off. To obtain a more accurate reading, we can use a narrower measuring cylinder. Question 2. A student investigates the cooling of hot water from different initial temperatures. She uses the apparatus shown in figure 2.1. Alright, as you can see here, we have got a thermometer, a beaker to hold your hot water, a clamp, and a retort stand holding your thermometer. Question A, part 1. The student measures the room temperature. Record room temperature theta r shown in the thermometer. This is 20 and as we can see here, the reading is 21. Part 2. Describe one precaution that the student takes to ensure that this temperature reading is as accurate as possible. As mentioned previously, when taking measurements on a scale, make sure to place your eyes perpendicular to the scale to avoid parallax error. Question B. Experiment A. The student pours a volume of 100 cm cube of hot water into the beaker and records the temperature theta A at time 0 seconds. She records the temperature of the water in the beaker every 30 seconds. Her readings for experiment A are shown in table 2.1. Experiment B. The student repeats the process. She waits until the initial temperature theta B of the water is the same value as the temperature theta A at 90 seconds in experiment A. In the first line of table 2.1, record her initial temperature of theta B for experiment B. Her readings for the remainder of experiment B are shown in table 2.1. Since the temperature of experiment A at 90 seconds is same with experiment B at 0 seconds, the value here would be 85.0. Part C. Write a conclusion stating how the temperature at time 0 affects the rate of cooling of the water. Justify your answer by reference to values from the results. Okay, for experiment A, the temperature started at 92 degrees Celsius and after 180 seconds, it was 80 degrees Celsius. This means that the change of temperature was 12 degrees Celsius. Whereas for experiment B, it started at 85 degrees Celsius and after 180 seconds, it became 75 degrees Celsius. So the change of temperature here is 10 degrees Celsius. This tells us that when the initial temperature is high, the change of temperature is higher. Compared to when the initial temperature is lower, the change of temperature is also lower. So you could use these differences to write your conclusion and justify your answer. Question D, Part 1. Calculate the average cooling rate X1 during the second half of experiment A. Use the readings from Table 2.1 and the equation, where T90 seconds and theta 90 and 180 are the temperatures at T equals to 90 seconds and T equals to 180 seconds in experiment A. Include the unit for the cooling rate. Since the equation is already given, all we have to do is substitute the values. In experiment A, the temperature at 90 seconds is 85 and 180 is 80. And the value of T is 90 seconds. Giving you this value and remember you have to write your answers in two significant figures so that would be 0 0.056. Do not forget to include your unit which is degree Celsius divided by time in seconds so that would be degree Celsius over seconds. Part 3. Calculate the average cooling rate x2 during the first half of the experiment. We're going to repeat the same thing but this time using the readings of experiment B at time 0 seconds and at time 90 seconds. At 0 seconds, it was 85 degrees Celsius. At 90 seconds, it's 79.5. And the time here is 90 seconds, giving you at two significant figures 0 0.061 and your unit degree Celsius per seconds. Question 3. A student states that x1 and x2 should be the same. State whether your result supports this suggestion and justify your statement by reference to your results. So let's find out whether x1 and x2 are the same. They are slightly different, but you need to find out in percentage how different they are. They have a difference of 8.5%, which is lesser than 15%. Therefore, we can say that the results of which x1 and x2 are the same is indeed true.
For justification, you could mention that this is because they fall within the limits of expectations where their difference is only less than 15%. Please note that for this type of question when they ask you to justify, please don't just leave your answer by mentioning that they fall within the limits of expectation. Make sure to also include a calculated value to prove your statement. Question E. State two variables which must be controlled so that the comparison of x1 and x2 is valid. The variables that have to be kept same to ensure the experiment is fair, to use the same volume of water and beaker. Question 3. A student investigates the properties of a resistance wire. He uses the circuit shown in figure 3.1. We have here a power supply, an emitter to measure current, a resistance wire and a crocodile clip which can vary the length of the resistance. So if you place the crocodile clip at this position, you are reducing the length that is in the circuit. Therefore, the resistance of the circuit will also reduce. Question A. On figure 3.1, draw a voltmeter connected to measure the potential difference PD across length L of the resistance wire. So this is your resistance wire and you should place your voltmeter across the component like this. Question B. Part 1. The student connects the crocodile clip to a length L 20 cm of the resistance wire. He measures the value of the potential difference and current for the resistance wire. The voltmeter reading here shows 1.3 and the emitter here shows 0.86. Read and record in the first line of table 3.1 the values V and I shown on the meters in figure 3.2 and 3.3. The student repeats the process for length. 40 cm, 60, 80, and 100 cm of the resistance wire in turn. His results are shown in table 3.1. Okay, so we'll just fill in the values of voltage and current here. Pay attention that all the values in this table are written in two significant figures. Next, part 2. For length 20 cm, calculate and record in table 3.1 the resistance R of the resistance wire. Use your values of V and I from B part 1 and the equation R equals to V over I. So for R here, we will use 1.3 voltage divided by 0.86 giving us this value. But we only use two significant figures so that would be 1.5. Question C. Plot a graph of resistance y-axis against length x-axis. Draw the straight line of best fit. Okay, let's first draw the x and y-axis. Don't forget to include your units when labeling your axis. Looking at this table, the range of x-axis is between 20 cm to 100 cm and the range of y-axis is between 1.5 ohms to 8.3 ohms. So for our range of y-axis, we could use 0 to 10. And for x-axis, we can start from range 0 to 100. Now we can plot all the points from the table. And some of you are asking for a best fit line, whether you should plot a straight line or a curve. Well, it should be obvious once you have plotted your points. For this graph, as you can see, we will observe a straight line. When drawing a line of best fit, you should touch as many points as you can and with roughly equal number of points above the line and below the line. I hope this is clear on how to draw a line of best fit. If it's still not clear, please let me know in the comment section so I can help you more. Question D part 1. Determine the gradient G of the graph. Show clearly on the graph how you obtain the necessary information. To find gradient, get two points furthest from each other and get their coordinates. Using the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, I got a value of 0 0.085. And do not forget your units, ohms per centimeter. Based on your marking schemes, a range of 0.073 to 0.093 is an acceptable answer. Part 2. The gradient G is numerically equal to the resistance per unit length R0 of the resistance wire. Write down a value of R0 for this experiment. Since they mention here that it is equal, the value of R0 will be the value of your gradient. Question E. Suggest one practical reason why students carrying out this experiment may not obtain the same readings as in Table 3.1. Assume that the procedure has been done carefully. 
Well, one common practical reason that could lead to different readings obtained by different students is that it is not easy to determine the exact position for the crocodile clip to measure the length. Question 4. A student investigates the motion of a ball through the air. Plan an experiment which will enable him to investigate how the range of the ball depends on the angle at which it is launched. The range is the horizontal distance that the ball travels after leaving the end of the channel shown in figure 4.1. Okay, so what happens here is the ball rolls down and it gets launched and the range is then determined by the distance that it travels once it lands. And to change the angle, we will place a protector here and change the position of the flexible channel to obtain different angles. Before planning the experiment, let's identify the key variables. So I like to remember the mnemonics, I don't care, to remember what variables I need to look for. So for the independent variable is what is being changed in this experiment, and that would be the angle at which the ball is launched. As for the dependent variable, that would be the variable that you're looking to investigate or record. And that would be the range of the ball. And lastly, to keep control so that the experiment is fair, to use the same mass for the ball and the height of the upper end of the channel should be the same for every angle during the launch of the ball. Let's continue reading. The apparatus available includes a flexible channel, which can be bent at different angles and a selection of balls, each of which different diameter and mass. So to plan your experiment, these are the bullet points that you should include. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to plan our experiment accordingly following each bullet points. So the first one is to list any additional apparatus needed. Well, the additional apparatus needed here would be your protector to measure different angles and a ruler to measure the distance. Remember that when you are asked to list any additional apparatus, please mention at least two apparatus to obtain a full mark for this bullet point. Next, explain briefly how to do the experiment. You may add to figure 4.1 if it helps your explanation. When explaining briefly on how to do the experiment, I'd like to use this method called Monkey Really Rocks where M stands for measure, R record, and repeat. So you're going to measure here your independent variable, which is the angle being launched. And next you're going to record the dependent variable, which is the distance range of the ball. And lastly, repeat the independent variable and mention for at least five other angles. Next, state the key variables to keep constant. For key variables to keep constant, also pay attention that you should mention at least two. And we have already discussed, to keep the experiment fair, we need to use the same mass of the ball, even though different masses are given, and the same diameter to ensure that this experiment is fair. An additional point that you could write would be the height of the channel when the ball is being launched. Next, Draw a table with column headings to show how to display the readings. You are not required to enter any readings in the table. When drawing a table, always include your independent variable and dependent variable, which is your angle for independent variable and distance for dependent variable. A very important note that you should pay attention to is that when drawing a table with column headings, make sure that your units are being included. And lastly, explain how to use the results to reach a conclusion. A common way to answer this is by plotting a graph, but you have to mention which variable goes to which axis. When plotting a graph on your y-axis, you will write your dependent variable, and your x-axis, you will show your independent variable. And this is how I like to remember them in case I forget. Okay, now we can write all our points into our answer space. I've only written it this way to show you each bullet point and in your exams make sure you write your answers in a paragraph form. That's all for this video. Thank you for watching and good luck to those who are taking your exam of Paper 6 Physics on the 24th October. Take care. Bye-bye.